2013, we had our 30th anniversary celebration at Celebrity Theater. Many of you might remember that. Mike Rock came in. And there's a number of people that are still part of our fellowship in other churches, like Dave and Suzanne Maxwell, uh, not Maxwell, Weddle moved a couple uh, years ago to Spokane. And then there's Steve and Fran Maxwell are in Colorado, and Mike and Libby are in, in uh, Orlando. So we have a membership. So if that was 2013 was our 30th, then that would make this our 40th, our 40th year. And again, the spirit has moved and we're together. And we're together, and it's not a perfect union, but it is a good thing. We've had so many things that have happened well, and so many things that have been trials. But Ryan's going to bring it up in a little bit, but we're going to acknowledge people that have, that have stayed, stayed strong, stayed in here. You know, building by numbers didn't work. I talked about building by the Spirit. That's why you might see programs like we had with uh, Emotional Healthy Spirituality and Christ-Centered Discipleship. Those aren't penalties to give you homework. Those are to strengthen us. Those are to keep you around. So if you haven't been here that long, you will be here that long. And if you have been here that long, you'll keep on going. So we have a great cloud of witnesses that have went before us. So well, the one thing that we have is that, but second, next slide, please. We're flexible. Gary and Pauline Taylor just moved back to town. I told Gary this slide was in there. He was worried that he was doing something strange, but I'll leave it to you. But we've been a flexible church. We've been a church that has wandered the desert for 40 years. We've wandered the Phoenix desert for 40 years. We didn't do this all because of money. I mean, that was maybe part of it, but we wanted to be a valley-wide church. And because so many selfishly moved further and further away, we had to use our research. Now, I'm one of those. I'm, I'm selfish. I moved to Prescott, so I'm, I'm putting myself in this category, but it's Susan's fault. Uh, So we needed multiple locations. Now, one a benefit, a benefit to being a mobile church is we need a lot of volunteers. This is not a spectator church, not with the singing, not with the serving. We get everybody involved. And if you're not involved, please raise your hand at somewhere. Go thank a servant, somebody that's serving right now, whether it's in your children's ministry or sound or setting up, singing, whatever. Thank them and then say, what can I do? How can I help? And I don't think you get turned down. We have volunteers. We've always had a volunteer. Church starts from ground, gets built up, taken down every week. Everything's mobile. And we have nice places like this, but we've met in parks. We've met in movie theaters. We've met in gymnasiums. And we've met all over the place. You would think as a church we're in the witness protection program. Third, next slide, please. ICOC began as kind of a campus movement. Now, most of our campus is coming down from Flagstaff. They were worshiping up there today. But it became as a campus movement. And campus is so important to the health of this church because it not only raises people up that become singles and marrieds and then parents and so on, but also is our future leaders. So many of the, the campus have served as interns and, and just being willing to help in that way and make a difference. And you know, back then, ASU is still standing, still taking your money, still growing. But we've also had a GCU and we've had these other community colleges. So we're still growing in the campus, which is exciting to see. Fourth, we put a big investment in children's ministry. It's not just the financial, it's the volunteers. There's so many of you in here that have helped out over the years as volunteers. It's made a difference. When I think of volunteers, I think of Erica Parker, who's probably not here right now. She kind of converted to Prescott too, but um, Erica was here for a generation of kids. And I'm grateful for my son grew up on it. Now him and his wife are, are coordinators for the children's ministry paying back, and he's got his children in there. And so many of you 
have had your children in there. And we have Travis now back with us, getting baptized this week. But one of my wife's passion is Vacation Bible School. And that's an old slide from the Vacation Bible School. And what's important to her and to me is both of our spiritual seeds were planted in Vacation Bible School. So all you're doing is planting seeds. You don't go to work in children's ministry because you're trying to get a two and a half year old to have their quiet times. You're trying to get a five year old to confess their sins. And you're trying to convince a seven year old to finish the study so they can get baptized. You're planting the seeds for the future. Last, we've been involved. We've been involved as a community. We've been involved in worldwide efforts. And so when we talk about the Hope Collection and all that, many of you have helped out. And Georgie has kind of spearheaded this for, for many years. But a lot of us have served over that time. Not only the talents locally, but our finances going to other places. Not only to places like the Philippines, but we've dealt with an orphanage in Mexico. We've dealt with uh, just a lot of projects. Right now, there's people going to El Salvador and they've been to Honduras, and they've been to, there's just a lot of projects around the world because there's a lot of needs around the world. And even places that are once paradise have needs, like Maui. So we have a lot of people to give. But our giving also is the financial part, is what we give for our special missions. So as mentioned earlier, right now we're at about 97% of what we need to make our goal this year. And the majority of that goes to Philippines, but it does spread out elsewhere, too. And we've always made it. We've always made it. One thing that Coco and Reilly uh, led the Philippines for years and years, one thing he said with tears from his stage in front of his whole congregation, when we were there for an anniversary service, he said, Phoenix was the one that stood with us. When the things were falling apart with the ICOC, Phoenix stood with us. Phoenix kept on sending us a check. And he was crying and just saying how much he appreciated Phoenix being there for them when they weren't sure what was going to happen in their future. So we have a lot of things that we've been a part of. This is important. If you can still give, we're collecting until the end of the month. If you can still give, throw a little bit more in there. It makes a difference. Last slide for me. 2 Corinthians 1. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him... The amen is spoken by us, the glory of God. Now as God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership upon us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Before Ryan comes up, let me say a prayer. Father, thank you so much. Standing firm. The Bible mentions over 20 times about standing firm. We don't know what the future will bring. We don't know what the present will bring. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. In fact, Ecclesiastes 7.14 says that God made the good as well as the bad. Therefore, we can discover nothing about our future. But we do know this. Our future is better with you. Our future is better when we rely on your spirit, on each other, and on the day-to-day -day decisions that we make to follow you. Bless us as a church going forward that we're able to look on this as another moment in time of all the special things that have happened. And pray for Ryan as he does his, his talk on the present. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good afternoon. I think that's close enough. Here we go. Uh, no, just grateful to be up here. You know, Bob is, is humble, but, you know, he is... Him and Susan, Bob is our elder and elder's wife. They serve tirelessly for our kingdom. And I'm so grateful to be up here with him and Forrest. Forrest and, and Mandy, uh, you know, Forrest is our lead evangelist, and, and Mandy, our women's ministry leader. Uh, but all of them serve tirelessly for our kingdom. But, and, but here's the thing is that we don't serve alone. And I'm so grateful that we have our staff. We have the Hawkins that, that serve East Point. They're right there. And they're, they're awesome. We have the Weeklies that serve Midpoint. We have, we, have, we have the Bustillos that serve youth and family. We have Isaac Duran, uh, who's on campus, Big Bunny, a.k.a., uh, who, who does incredible things for us. Uh, and no, I didn't forget Jesse, but we'll come to him in a second.
God is doing incredible things in the present time in the Phoenix Church. He just really is. You know, and, and one of the things he's done is we've added new staff. Next slide. You know, Anthony Carino is now an intern at GCU Westside Campus Ministry, and we're grateful for that. We're grateful that he's there. And then young Van Meter, Molly herself, is at ASU Tempe. You know, and, and they're just incredible servants for the kingdom of God. But like I said, God is always working. I, and, you know, in, in John 5, 17, as Jesus is getting ready, yeah, he was being persecuted uh, for healing the invalid at the pool on the Sabbath. He says these words. He says, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. And I just love it because you, we know that God is working. And what Jesus is saying is that regardless of the day of the week, even on the Sabbath, that between God and Jesus, they show their love, their mercy, their compassion. It's always happening. It's always going on. God's love never ceases. You know, but I think one of the things he calls us to is to take action. He wants us to, to take action to show his love, to show his mercy, to show his compass, compassion to a hurting world. And it's important that we give God a place to show up and show off. And I'm just grateful because, like, you know, here on a Sunday, God is working. He's doing tremendous things. But he's not limited to, you know, here at FBCS. You know, I, I've, I've heard the rumor, but it's true now that in Prescott, next slide, that, the next, that in Prescott, they are now officially a church. They have their own 501c3. It is the Prescott International. And that's really Holy Spirit driven. You know, they, they had a couple of families that moved up there, and then they stole the Durfees, and then they stole the Wadines. No, that was the Holy Spirit. No, God moved and families have moved up there, and they continue to grow. That's the Holy Spirit. And now they have Rich up there part-time uh, as a minister, and God is doing his thing. Him and Debbie are serving tirelessly for the Prescott Church. You know, and then we have Jesse Thomas. Now, Jesse Thomas, he took a shift. Stephanie went back. Her old job called her back, and they said, we want you, and they, and they got her. You know, that's, just, that's how the Holy Spirit works. But Jesse, in his kindness, stayed on. and still be serving as a youth minister in the middle school. But now we have a new position. We have a digital evangelism coordinator. And you guys are like, what is that? Well, it means we're going to save more souls. People are always searching the internet for something. As a Phoenix church, we want to be there when they're searching for Jesus. And that people understand that they have a place to come where we will love them, we will show them the scriptures, and teach them who God is. You know, and then at GCU, GCU is popping now. Now, in the west side. So, a couple of years ago, we had three people, and we had a dream, but Pete and Vanessa, and we're like, okay, Lord, increase our faith, and God's just been moving. Now, there's 14 students on the campus at GCU. And it's so incredible, and it's, it, God's just blessing. We, we have Bible studies that are going on. Uh, we had a Bible talk the other night, and 20 minutes, Satan didn't want it to happen. He threw off our room. We lost our room, I mean, literally minutes before our Bible talk. But in 20 minutes of sharing, we have five visitors there, and it was just a powerful time there at GCU. And then I think about our Yo Pros ministry. That's our young professionals. Now, I've heard about the young professionals. I have words described to me like dynamic, that they're growing together, that they're building relationships. You know, they're setting the tone. Hear that? Setting the tone for godliness after campus, after the college life. And then I found this picture, and I thought to myself, I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I thought, do I pray for them? I, didn't, I wasn't sure. No. Actually, at the end of the day, they're, they're having a blast in Jesus. They're, they're a good-looking group, besides the picture. They are a good-looking group. No, they really are. And it's a, they're beautifully spiritually. And they're doing things for Jesus in a world where, where they could be doing other things. And they're creating success and, and creating pathways for our next generation and really to set the pace for their, or set the pace for their generation. Like I said, God is always working. But it's also important for us to know in the present time that God is working in you. You know, in Philippians 2, verse, and this is the NLT, it says, Dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you. 
giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. And I, I'll stop right there, but you know, here's Paul's encouragement to the church to work hard. What he's saying is don't, don't stop halfway you know, on your salvation, you know, to, to work it out fully until everything's been accomplished in you. Don't hold back. Keep going. Understand the power of the gospel that you have your hands on, that you had a hold of, that is training you to be more like Jesus. You know, it says obeying with deep reverence and fear. In the NIV, it says fear and trembling, which is, it just means that it just drives us to see God, to be close to God. How are you doing in going after God? Do you realize, do you recognize that a life without God is empty? That we don't face the challenges the same way our eternity is dependent on him. To see his power, to see his love. I love the dimensions of the Holy Spirit and understand that we receive it after the resurrection in that moment of baptism. Understand the power of who Jesus is. And he takes that and he says that he, he is inside of us that God is working, and he gives us that desire in us that when we see the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection to be saved. And see, I, I, I want to communicate to us this afternoon that, that Christianity isn't just an emotional response. It's really the power of God working in our lives, the power to do what pleases him, and that he's continuously with us. And when we think about the Holy Spirit, and like I said, no, there's no sin that's conquered. That's what Jesus wants to do in our life. He wants to conquer sin. He wants us to keep kicking out, to find righteousness that is truly achieved fully with God. And he says to do it without complaining and arguing. And I think about this in the next slide. We need to be careful not to try to outpace God. And here's what I mean. You know, as children of God, you know that there's going to be times where we, we maybe we feel like God is not doing it enough. You know, that he's not working powerfully, he's not working quickly enough in our lives. Have you ever been there? You know, maybe he's not working fast enough in someone else's life. Maybe it's, it's a spouse, it's a child, it's a co-worker, a neighbor. Or maybe you just feel like he's not working fast enough in the church. There's moments where we're, 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 we're tempted to go to places that God is saying, no, get away from that. We, we exhaust ourselves and God's just saying, hold on to me. Understand who you are and what you're meant to be, how you were built. Because the Bible reminds us to live clean and innocent lives. Children of God, shining, bright, shining like bright lights. That's what this group is. We're a group of children of God, shining like bright lights, holding firmly to the word of life. You know, in the past few weeks, God is doing such amazing things. You know, when I, when I think... When I think about what's happened, a few baptisms in the past week, Ashita Adams, she got baptized in the team ministry and quickly went to the campus ministry. You know, I think of Debbie Mamula, who got baptized in the Midpoint region, is doing her thing for God. I think about Emory Brown, at 15 years old, made Jesus Lord of her life. And Travis Taylor, he's still wet coming out of the water from Wednesday night but he got baptized Wednesday night. But I want to encourage us before Forrest comes up. If you've been a disciple or you're restored to this church in the last two years, stand up. If you've been, if you've been baptized or restored in the past two years, stand up. Right, stay standing. Stay standing. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Everybody's going to be, here we go. I want to encourage you to hold firmly to the word of life. Don't give up. Satan wants you to, 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 to give up, to walk away. He wants to tempt you, but you have life to the full right now. Hold on to it strong and don't give up. Stay standing. If anybody that's been a Christian 25 years or longer, stand up. Woo! Wow. Stay, everybody stay standing. For everybody that's in here, these are the OGs. These are the OGs of Christianity. And when they say back in the day, these guys were there. 
You know, these are, these are many of our big brothers, our big sisters, our aunts and uncles in the faith. I look forward to joining you one day, but these are the ones that we can pick and glean so much information and wisdom from in our fellowship. You know, for all of us, this is what we have right here before us. They have gone to hundreds of church services, midweeks, and other church gatherings, but it's how they have lived their lives between those meetings that counts. Not that it's been perfect or they've been perfect. They have held onto their faith through their spiritual journey. Now everybody else stand. You know, I know many of us fit many of these categories in our faith that we all need to hold on to the word of life. You know, if, if you're new to us, find out what it means to, if you're new to us and you're, you're visiting today, what it means to have Christ working. You talk to the person that invited you. But God is calling all of us right now in this present time. You know, that, that, that for us to, to have a light that shines bright in this crook, crooked and perverse world. I believe that God wants to do an amazing things, you know, through this group right here. Before force goes up, I want to pray for all of us. Please remain standing. We pray that the eyes of our heart, it says in Ephesians 1, 18, that may be enlightened in order that we may know you. The, we may, we, uh, sorry, we may know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of your glorious inheritance in your holy people, and your incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength as you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And Father, we just ask you that we hold on to, God, who you are. God, as you are working around us, that you will give us a place, God, that you can show up and show off, God, with your love, with your compassion, with your mercy. But God, that we can see you working in us. God, to hold firmly to the word of life to fight for our salvation, to fight for you, to fight for your kingdom. And God, allow it to propel us into a, a 21st century or the, you know, 2023 for the rest of this year, 2024. God, that we will give glory and honor to you. God, thank you for times like this that we come together. Love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Well, that was a good exercise to wake you back up. I know it's, uh, it's always a long day when you have afternoon service, so thank you for coming out and joining us today a little later. Uh, it's exciting to think about the PCC past, the PCC present, and I'm going to wrap it up here, of course, by talking about a little bit of the PCC future. I'm not claiming to be able to predict the future, don't worry, but, but I do have some things I think God's put on my heart that I've heard from a lot of you that I want to share and give us a vision for as we close out. But I just really appreciate Bob. Uh, you know, Bob represents many of you in this room, people who have invested blood, sweat, and tears into this church. I appreciate him as a brother and a friend. Um, you know, I know, and many people in this room stand on the shoulders of other people to be able to be here today. So thank you for those of you who are longstanding members for all that you've done to bring the church this far. Appreciate Jonesy, you know, bringing us back to what God is doing right now. That's exciting, isn't it? Baptisms and restorations, and, and God is adding to the church in so many ways. And every one of you is so important to the future of the church. I hope you got what he was saying. God is doing something in you. He's doing something in all of us, and that's so important that you figure out what that is for you, and you bring that not just to your life, but you bring that to our church. This weekend was a great example of that. We had our cultural celebrations this weekend. Uh, of course, it started last night with the Festival de las Americas out in the east. I was there. I didn't do much of that. I did a lot of eating, mostly. Really delicious food from Guatemala and, and Honduras and Mexico and... Uh, I, I ate too much. And then I showed up today, you know, and we had our, our, our cultural celebration that the squad put on. Thank you, squad, for putting that on. That was awesome. Um, and, you know, I, I ate too much there as well, Italian and Filipino and Chinese. And, uh, and it was awesome to hear our, our, our sisters and our brother pray in different languages. Wasn't that awesome? You had no idea what they were saying, probably, most of you, like me, unless you speak those languages. A few of you maybe do. But it's just awesome to see that, that God's vision of the church is way bigger, right, than just this little group of people gathering here, that we are part of something that is worldwide, something that is heavenly. And so I want to wrap up our time today, just a few minutes, to talk about the PCC future. What is God trying to do next? 
You know, Mandy and I, we, we serve in an, an, a lead role, so we get to touch a lot of all parts of the church in different ways at times, making connections with many of you in different ministries. And we're grateful for, you know, we're grateful for our leadership team, which consists of our elder and his wife and the evangelist and women's ministry leaders currently. And we're grateful for all the family group leaders in the East and the West and Midpoint, our campus ministry, our youth and family ministry. There's so many great things, and we're very grateful, Mandy and I, for the leadership uh, that we have. But I'm so grateful to connect with all of you as well. I love it when I just get to meet new people or re-meet people because I forget names when I visit the West. And, you know, and it's just awesome to see, you know, to see what we already have. But to, today to, to think, what could we become in Christ? What, what more does God want to do? He's done many great things, clearly, as we kind of reflected on, on 40 years, right, as Bob was talking. And there's just three things I believe God is pointing us toward in the future that I hear from a lot of you. And I believe God desires for us. The first is to be biblically deeper. To be biblically deeper. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says the word of God is alive and active. That means it's as relevant in 2023 as it was in 33 AD. Amen? And it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. First of all, the Bible is just flat out amazing. I mean, what, what a blessing, right, to open up our Bibles together and, or to have that quiet time, you know, all the things that we, we strive to do as a church. But here it says, you know, it compares it to what? It compares it to a, a sword, right, a sword. And that's kind of a, a, an offensive weapon. Well, in my opinion, we live in 2023 in the most self-indulgent and truth-confused truth time in the history of humanity. I don't know if you feel that way, but I feel that way. How do we combat that? People are just selfish and, and people are confused about what even truth is. You know, whether it's gender or, or whatever else, people are very confused. Well, we combat that with the Word of God. We combat that with the Word of God and we, and we hold to its teachings. The PCC's future, health, and spirituality deeply depends on us saturating our lives, our hearts, our families, our speech, our ministries beyond the corrosive cultural norms with the penetrating and revealing word of God. That is our greatest hope in the future is to cling to the word of God. We have culture inside the church. This church is 40 years old. We have traditions. I don't know if you know that. We don't think we do. We're non-denominational, but we are traditional. We are in many ways, and so that's fine, but Jesus said in Matthew 15 to the, to the Jews in his day, he said, if your traditions, if you hold to those more than the word of God, they nullify the word of God. So as a church, we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep looking at what we do, what we practice and how we do it, and ask ourselves if we clearly see that in scripture or not. And we're gonna continue to do that and, and fight for that and grow in that together, and that's gonna be an exciting thing for our church culture. But we gotta continue to... Uh, fight the culture outside the church as well. And I don't mean that in a political sense at all, because I think that's a joke. What I mean by that is there's this cultural creep. There's always this idea of trying to water down clear biblical truth. There's always this cultural creep of trying to water down, you know, please accept this, please promote that, but it doesn't actually, it's not supported in scripture, but the culture wants us to support it. What do we do with that? Well, well, 2 Timothy 4.2 says you preach the word. You, You cling to the word of God. And so we've got to, as a church, make sure that every brother and sister knows what they believe and why they believe it from Scripture. Christ-centered discipling, disciple makers was a start in that. But we're going to be developing more and more of that. And I hope you're excited in the future to dig deeper and deeper in your Bibles together. Amen. I look forward to that. So I hope our future is more biblical. The second thing here is I hope it's more spirit-led. I hope and pray it's more spirit-led. The scripture is very simple there, and sorry I didn't do that very well format. I apologize for that. But it's Galatians 5.25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. For our future as a church to be brighter and brighter, we must keep in step with the Holy Spirit. I love it. Today the Holy Spirit's been mentioned a lot. It's come out all kind of through the service. We talk a lot about God the Father, as we should. We talk a lot as a church, and we better, about Jesus, God the Son, But we've got to make sure the other part of the Godhead is not forgotten, which is God, the Holy Spirit. And like Bob said, that's a deposit inside a believer, guaranteeing their inheritance. Like it says in Ephesians 1, it unleashes power, resurrection-type power. 
That's a pretty exciting thing. But just because we have the Holy Spirit, according to Galatians 5.25, doesn't mean we're keeping in step with the Spirit. And my thing is, I I don't know exactly where God's trying to go, but I want to go where he's going. I don't know exactly what it means tomorrow, Monday morning at 7 a.m. when I wake up, you know, to keep in step with the Spirit, but I want to figure that out. And I sense in our church a, a hunger, a longing, for a spiritual awakening. I sense in our church when I talk to a lot of you that, that we want to see God do more, not less. That we want our future to be more and more full of him. And I think as a church, we've got to be more and more spirit-led. We've got to take a step back. Well, we, why do we do this? Well, because this is how we've always done it. Well, maybe that's not spirit-led anymore. Maybe God wants to do something new. Now, the Holy Spirit will not contradict Scripture. Back to my first vision staying biblically deeper and biblically true, but you understand what I'm saying. We gotta be willing to explore the illimitable rages of the Spirit of God when it comes to ministry, when it comes to our Spanish ministry. That What is God trying to do in the Spanish ministry? Are we keeping in step with the Spirit? Our youth and family ministry. For our mature singles, I, I think God wants to use our mature singles. You guys have so much to offer the church. And we've not done a great job helping you step forward. We gotta do a better job, that's just one example. And so I hope and pray that we as a church can become more spirit-led. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. This blew me away. He says, we may as well face it. The whole level of spirituality among us is low. He wrote this in the 40s. I still agree with it. We have measured ourselves by ourselves until the incentive to seek higher plateaus in the things of the spirit is all but gone. We have imitated the world sought popular favor, manufactured delights to substitute for the joy of the Lord and produced a cheap and synthetic power to substitute for the power of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes you keep in step with the Spirit by going back to the ancient paths. But sometimes you keep in step with the Spirit by going to new fields that the Spirit is calling you to. And in my experience, and probably in this church for sure, it's going to be a little bit of both. I hope and pray that we as a church will be more and more open to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in our lives, in our ministries, and in our church. And the last thing here, as we close out, I think God is pointing us to a little more in the future, is revival for all. Revival for all, Acts 2.17. The first uh, sermon post-resurrected Christ, the first gospel presentation is, of course, in Acts chapter 2 by the apostle Peter. And he quotes Joel chapter 2 in his sermon early on, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and he he says... Basically, what what Joel prophesied about is being fulfilled right now in front of your eyes. And what was part of that prophecy in Acts 2, 17? In the last days, God says, I pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream, dream. You know, as time goes on, you know, we're 40 years in right now as a church. We must become, I believe, more and more interracial and more and more intergenerational. More and more interracial and more and more intergenerational. I hope you understand those words. Interracial. The Spirit is going to be poured out on on all people. Matthew 28, go make disciples of all nations, right? You understand what I'm saying, and this weekend was a great example of that. Celebrating our Spanish ministry and all their heritage. Uh, the, The celebration of culture the squad put on this afternoon, you know, it helps us see how diverse Disciple making should be. It should be for all people in Phoenix when we open our doors. Someone from any background, any kind of preference or, 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 or you know, cultural trend or whatever should be able to walk through these doors and feel loved and accepted and appreciated. And it doesn't mean they don't have some things to repent of or it doesn't mean they don't need to get saved and get the Holy Spirit, but, that, but this would be a place dominated by the love of Christ more than anything else. And again, the Spirit is what enables us to do that. One of the fruits of the Spirit is love, right? One of the fruits of the Spirit is love. But we've got to keep working on that as a church. We have, you know, our squad is trying to help us figure out how to navigate those tricky waters of culture and race. And it's not an easy thing. And, and yeah, it's pretty calm right now in America, but we know we're going to have those challenges again. It's around the corner. And this is such a special part of the gospel. The world, the world doesn't know how to bring all people together. This doesn't happen anywhere else the rest of the week. I guarantee you. Look around the room. I guarantee you there's no other place where this kind of diversity comes together. We come together because of Christ. And so we got to keep growing in that. we got to keep learning how to do that. we gotta, we got to become a bilingual church eventually. where We have just as much Spanish ministry as English ministry. 
because a good part of our population doesn't speak English, uh, even here in Phoenix. You, you understand what I'm saying, and that's exciting. That's exciting. We've got to revive all people, and lastly here, we've got to revive all ages. We've got to revive all ages. Yeah, the, you know, the young men see visions, it says there in Acts 2.17. But wait a second. The old men also dream dreams, Amen. And yeah, look around the room. You know, we're not, we're, we're not all young here. I, can say, I include myself in there. Now, I got Greg coming in on both sides of the beard here. I, I need my glasses to see that screen now. You know, I'm getting there. I'm with you. And the early church was a picture of revival for all. And so we in the future want to be youthful, but also wise. We in the future want to grow old, but stay young. How do we do that? That's not easy. Most churches fail by the third generation or so. And, and so by the time you get to the third generation of the, of the, you know, basically the grandkids of the founders of that church, they don't have the convictions anymore. They don't have, they don't have the, the life anymore. They, they even start to water down the doctrine. It's true in business. Business owners, the, the first generation, blood, sweat, and tears start the business. Second generation, you know, the sons and daughters tend to embrace that and maintain that business and that wealth. But when you get to the third generation in business and wealth, only 12% remains. And when you get to the fourth generation, only 4% remains. That's just a business well statistic. And I think there's a lot of correlation in the church. We've got to learn as a church to really help our third generation, our fourth generation, to, to, to take all the resources that we can give them, our wisdom, our, our expertise, our understanding, even our money, but then have a first generation type attitude. And I think we can figure this out. I think we've got to figure this out in the PCC. Because we have a lot of wealth of wisdom and resources in this room. I mean, like Bob said, we've hit our special missions 20 years in a row. I mean, that's, am that's amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. But how often, if you're an older person in the church, do you embrace the younger generation? You walk around teenagers. Every time you come into church, do you talk to them? Do you greet them? Do you engage them? Are you warm with them? They're not going to walk up to you. They're intimidated. As an older Christian, we've got to be the friendliest people in the room. Because we have a lot to offer the young people. But you got to build a relationship. Well, I invited them to my house for lunch, and they didn't seem to want to come. They barely know you, dude. They're not just going to show up at your house. The younger generation, it's a little intimidating. So we, as the older Christians, I'm not down on you. We have so much to offer. But you got to open up your home. you got to open up your mouth. The young people, they need your wisdom. They, they need your experiences. But you got, you got to reach out. And younger people... You, I'm not letting you off the hook here. And the campus is at the retreat, so man, they're getting off the hook. But uh, I talk to them all the time anyway. But younger people, I, ho I hope you don't see the church as a threat or as a, as a burden. We, we, want you to, we want you to have the resources. We want to set you up. You are the future. Literally, I should just preach this point about you. Young people, you are the future. We need you. We need, you're, you're so valuable. Your innovation, your zeal, your faith is so valuable to moving the church forward. And if we can combine the young faith and zeal and innovation, and we, we can combine the old wisdom and conviction and strength, what could God do in the future here in the PCC? I mean, think about that for a second. A lot of us, when we were young Christians, we didn't have any money in the church. We didn't know what we were doing, and we were obsessed with growing. And, and, and we've, we've learned, we've learned. But, but imagine if we combine our wisdom with, with a youth movement, which we have still in this church, praise God for that, Teens getting baptized, campus students getting converted. We can combine those two things. What could God do in the future? If you're new to us today, uh, thank you for joining our little family talk here. Uh, we hope you can join us next week. We're not here. We're, we're out in Peoria at 3 p.m. and out in Chandler Glendale, or Chandler, wow, no, Chandler Glendale, Chandler Gilbert area at 10 a.m. Go to our website and check it out and get more information on the table as you walk out. But we hope, if you're new to us, you can be more and more of a spiritual part you know, of, of our past and our present and our future, and we hope we can combine that with you uh, in the days and weeks and months uh, to come. But I really hope and pray, PCC, that we can stand in gratitude and awe of our past. God has done great things here in 40 years. That we can rejoice in and enjoy all God is doing in our present, amen? A lot of good news. But that we continue to strive together to build a greater church in the future. Amen. Thank you so much.